Ready when you are. Okie dokie. Okay, I would like to uh, get started here so that uh, we can keep everybody on time. Uh, my name is Michael Young, I'm at the University of Texas, and uh, it is a pleasure to, um, to welcome everybody to our RISC uh, webinar. Um, the Regional Induced Seismicity Collaborative, which we call RISC, has been doing these webinars now for several years. Um, we really try to, uh, to hit the uh, uh, somewhere between hardcore science and, and you know, citizen science, we want to try to make the, the research that's being done by the state surveys um, you know, digestible to a wide variety of different, uh, different attendees. And so uh, that's been a, it's been a lot of fun to, uh, to run these and, uh, uh, and so welcome. Um, just really quickly about risk, um, the collaborative has been around for four or five years. It's been funded by Department of Energy uh, through NETL and the Groundwater Protection Council in Oklahoma. And so we're super grateful for all of their support. And um, RISC was, was really set up um, and to, to kind of tie together the state geological surveys in the Southern Mid-Continent of the United States. And this includes Oklahoma, New Mexico, Texas, Kansas, and Arkansas. And, uh, and so um, the idea then is, to, is for our state surveys to work together to solve these common problems of induced seismicity that are occurring across our borders. And um, today is a particular example of what some of the things that RISC uh, has been working on, uh, focusing specifically in the, in the Permian Basin. So it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Mary Litherland and Dino Wong. Um, and, uh, and I will uh, just uh, uh, introduce them quickly and then let them take it, take it from there. Uh, Mary received her BS in Neuroscience at Rice University here in Texas and a PhD in Geophysics at Stanford, working on seismic imaging of the Ruby Mountains Metamorphic Core Complex in Northeastern Nevada. Uh, since 2008, she has been working at New Mexico Bureau of Geology as the manager of the New Mexico Tech Seismological Observatory. And she is co-presenting with Dino Wong here at the Bureau. Uh, Dino has an MS in Marine Geophysics from the National Taiwan University and a PhD in Geophysics from the State University of New York at Binghamton. Uh, his research interests include studying seismic tectonics of subduction zone and intraplate seismicity. He has spent several years uh, in an R&D role in the oil and gas industry focusing on induced seismicity. And he currently works as a seismologist on the TexNet program and in the Center of, uh, for Integrated Seismicity Research. And so with that, um, welcome uh, Mary and Dino and uh, please take it away. Appreciate you being here. Thank you, Michael. Um, so I'm Mary and I'll be uh, giving the first part of this presentation and then Dino will be chiming in later to present the work that he did on this project, which is a really exciting project um, because as Michael mentioned, this is actually a project that was funded by RISC, so we're excited to, to present some of our results here at this RISC webinar, and is a great example of the collaborative research that RISC was intended to promote um, between different states. Um, and so Dino over at Texas and I here in New Mexico um, have been working together on this project, uh, combining different techniques, um, and basically, you know, doing what we can to um, improve the catalog of earthquakes, uh, specifically in the New Mexico portion of the Delaware Basin, um, which is an area that has a pretty long history of seismic monitoring, um, but uh, you know, needed, needed some work in order to uh, get the locations of the earthquakes to be more accurate um, so that they can be used to better st study the induced seismicity that's occurring in the region. So I'm gonna divide this talk basically into two parts. The first part will be sort of a brief overview of some of the uh, recent developments of the induced seismicity specifically in New Mexico and some of the improvements that we've been making to sort of our, our physical infrastructure in terms of the uh, network uh, in this area. And I think we have some really exciting things that have been happening uh, in this area in terms of improving our monitoring capabilities. Um, and then in the second half, uh, Dino and I are going to talk about the uh, project we did uh, to look at the 
data catalog, the existing data catalog for southeastern New Mexico, um, and use various techniques to uh, find uh, more events in the data sets that we already had and also get more accurate locations for those events. Um, so first I'll just look at, you know, show you this slide of New Mexico as a whole. This is um, the seismic activity uh, that has been uh, recorded by New Mexico Tech uh, from 1960 when we established our first seismic network um, in Socorro in central New Mexico, which is an area um, where we see a lot of seismicity from uh, the extension of the Rio Grande Rift and the Socorro magma body. So this is all naturally occurring seismicity um, all the way through the end of 2020, um, where in recent years, we started to see um, more of these earthquakes up in northeastern New Mexico in the Raton Basin. And of course, of particular interest today, uh, southeastern New Mexico, the Delaware Basin. So oil and gas production in New Mexico um, has long been a very important part of the state's economy. Um, and in recent years, it has uh, you know, obviously um, increased in, in the amount of uh, resources that are being developed uh, thanks to some of the enhanced recovery techniques. Um, and the majority of the oil and gas production occurs in the Delaware Basin in southeastern New Mexico. Um, but, you know, we also, you know, uh, are concerned about uh, what we're seeing in, in the San Juan Basin and particularly the Raton Basin, which also um, experiences some induced seismicity. Um, and one thing that I like to point out about uh, these oil and gas producing basins in New Mexico is that all three of the major oil and gas producing basins span state borders. And so, of course, what we're seeing uh, in these basins doesn't stop in one particular state and requires collaboration between different states. Uh, so this is a chart of the uh, oil production um, in New Mexico from 1970 uh, to 2020. And you can see that it sort of declined and remained steady for many years um, until beginning to increase rapidly um, you know, in the uh, late 2000s. Um, and that's a rise that has continued to the present. Uh, and Accompanying that rise in production, um, we have also seen a increase in seismicity, specifically just specifically in the last two years. So if you look at this chart, you'll see that you know between 2000, it, it doesn't really extend much prior to it doesn't extend prior to 2005, but there wasn't much seismicity in New Mexico prior to um, then either. And you can see that between about 2005 and 2010, um, we did see elevated seismicity. Uh, this was primarily a cluster of events um, northwest of Carlsbad called the Dagger Draw Cluster. Um, and then that uh, cluster of seismicity subsided and we saw very low seismicity for several years, um, specifically in New Mexico. Um, and then, you know, a little bit later than uh, you guys in Texas uh, started to see the big increases in induced seismicity. Um, we saw, you know, a huge jump of seismicity between 2019 and 2020. And it's not on this figure um, because we're not done with 2021 yet, but uh, we've continued to see a large number of earthquakes in 2021. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we sort of saw this earlier cluster of seismicity uh, in Dagger Draw, um, which uh, you know, was, was a pretty interesting uh, area of seismicity because um, the seismicity began to rise uh, a number of years after the uh, rise and peak of the production in that area. Um, and it also occurred an average of 15 kilometers west of the Dagger Draw oil field. And so um, people have um, studied this and done some modeling uh, to suggest that this was due to the uh, migration of fluids from the oil field to uh, an area of faulting that could be seismically reactivated and that it just you know, took some amount of time to get to that um, area that was vulnerable to the, the reactivation of seismicity. Um, and then in more recent years, um, 
in 2020 and 2021, um, actually this is a typo, sorry, it should say, uh, there was a cluster of 140 events, uh, all occurring within a period of three days from June 28th to 30th of 2020, not 2021, um, near Lovington and Hobbs. Um, and th this, this cluster occurred all over a period of three days and uh, we have not really seen much seismicity in that area either before or since. Um, and so people are still sort of trying to figure out what was the cause of that particular cluster. Um, and then also um, we've been seeing a cluster of events uh, at the Lee and County, Lee and Eddy County borders and also close to this, you know, crossing the state line with Texas. Um, and the largest event that's occurred in recent years in New Mexico was in that cluster of magnitude uh, 4.0 on July 19th of 2021. So with this increase in seismicity, um, we've been really trying to work on uh, some of the uh, you know, monitoring capabilities that we have for this area. And um, what you're seeing here is a, um, this is a map of the seismic stations that were operating in Southeastern New Mexico prior to 2018. And the reason that we had a network in this area at all um, was due to the location of the WIP nuclear waste disposal facility in this area. And what you can see is that, um, you know, we it was a relatively sparse network, um, sort of centered around the WIP facility, which was in this region. And um, most of the, actually all of the stations um, until some of them were recently upgraded were single component uh, short period stations. Um, and, you know, that, that was fine when we had, you know, a limited amount of seismicity. Um, the purpose of the network was to monitor the state of seismicity um, in terms uh, of the potential hazard to the website. Um, but due to the fact that um, in recent years, the seismicity has increased significantly, um, we've had a really concerted effort to uh, increase the number of stations. So what you can see here is the blue states, the blue triangles are the stations that uh, I showed you on the previous slide. And um, those were the stations that have been operating in this area for a long time. Um, several of those stations were actually upgraded to broadband stations, including um, three in collaboration with TexNet. Um, and then uh, several others were upgraded thanks to a uh, donation of sensors that we received at the network. Um, and then these four stations up in the northeast corner of this region uh, were added uh, in response to the uh, cluster of seismicity that occurred in, uh, in 2020. Um, as you can see, prior to those four stations being added, we had very little uh, in terms of monitoring in this area. And so that's one of the reasons um, that there's a fair amount of uncertainty uh, in what happened in that cluster. We haven't really seen uh, that many events happening here since then. So we still aren't totally sure uh, what's going on in that area. But the main area where we've had a significant increase of stations um, is uh, in this region of the um, cluster of seismicity near the state line, um, which is what we're gonna be focusing on in the second part of our talk as well. And um, these stations were installed by the USGS, uh, led by Justin Rubenstein. And I also, um, you know, I assisted with the installation of these stations uh, since due to COVID, um, it would otherwise have been very challenging to um, get these stations out there. And so, as you can see, you know, thanks to this, uh, this uh, installation by the USGS, we now have a very dense network of stations in this area that can be used to uh, get much more accurate locations um, for the earthquakes that are that are happening uh, so that we can better understand what's going on with them. Uh, so that was the part of my talk about the, uh, you know, sort of general overview of the induced seismicity we're seeing in New Mexico, along with uh, some of the recent improvements to the network. Um, now we're going to get to the main part of the talk, um, which was a collaboration between 
me and Dino uh, to sort to do some you know foundational work towards improving the earthquake catalog in southeastern New Mexico. Um, because as I stated earlier, uh, we've had a network in southeastern New Mexico for a pretty long time, um, but it was not that dense. You know, most of the stations are to the north of or were to the north of where we're seeing most of the seismic activity uh, in recent years. And um, most of the stations only had a, a single component. Um, in addition to that, uh, we used a very, you know, in terms of the um, earthquake locations that we here at the, you know, at New Mexico Tech and the New Mexico Bureau of Geology have been doing, you know, we used a very simple 1D model in terms of uh, calculating the locations for these earthquakes. Um, we have not uh, had the ability, we have not had this, you know, the station density or a good enough velocity to calculate depths for these events with any reasonable amount of certainty. So while we have a catalog and while it's certainly been useful, um, in terms of some of the further research that really needs to be done in this area, it was not really sufficient. And so uh, we use two main methods uh, for this project to uh, improve the catalog. Template matching uh, to expand the number of events that we're able to detect. And then um, Dino used uh, a new velocity model that he's developed to uh, produce more accurate locations uh, for the events. Um, so template matching uh, is um, basically a method of taking earthquakes in a catalog that you already have picks for that were identified by an analyst and using um, a match filter method to correlate those templates that you've selected um, with your continuous data and in order to produce new detections. And this is particularly useful for detecting additional seismic events near where the template events were located. And the reason for this is because um, basically if you have another earthquake that has a similar signal to your templates, um, when you run your uh, cross correlation, you're gonna get a, a high correlation um, for those other events. And so then you're able to, to um, select those events as additional detections. If there's other earthquakes that are happening in areas um, that are, you don't have templates in, the waveform similarity is likely not to be enough to produce a detection. However, um, you know, we use a pretty large catalog of, of events and we often do see that um, these earthquakes tend to happen in cluster. And so this is an appropriate method for um, finding more earthquakes uh, in our data. Uh, so the program that we used um, for this method was ca is called EQ CoreScan. Um, it's a Python-based computing package um, that's uh, used for performing uh, template matching. Um, it can also be used for subspace detection, which is another way to um, find more events in a particular localized area. Um, we didn't actually use it for that yet, although you know we'd like to, to um, do some more exploration in that area. Um, but for this preliminary analysis, um, we selected uh, 342 earthquakes uh, in, that occurred in New Mexico from 2018 to 2021 to use as our templates. Um, this is just sort of showing the overall process. You know, we run those templates on daylight traces. Um, and then finally, we use a, a process called leg calc, um, which generates uh, a pick corrected catalog of events from the detections that we made. Um, and then once we generate that catalog, we had to look through it. Um, we spent a, a fair amount of time iterating the parameters that we used for this detection. So you can see in some of our early attempts, um, we were picking up some of these you know, artifacts in the data as detections. Um, and also uh, there were some detections where you know, the, the detection even looked pretty good, but it was only on a, it was only observable on a few stations. So, you know, we sort of tweaked our parameters to try and, you know, reduce the number of false positives, um, but also, you know, be able to, to detect as many events as possible. Um, and you can see here an example of, of an earthquake that, um, 
that was detected using this uh, method. Um, and so we use that to sort of generate um, this new larger catalog that included our previously picked events and also um, the additional events detected by the template matching. Um, and then we took that catalog of events uh, here at Tech and we sent it over to uh, Dino to do some work um, to basically, uh, you know, further prune down the catalog and then, uh, you know, uh, get more accurate locations for them. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Dino now, who's going to talk about um, the work that, that he did. Thanks, Mary. Okay, let me share my screen now. Okay. Can everyone see that? Full presentation mode, please. Oh, yes. Sorry about that. Looks good. Looks good. Okay, okay. So Mary hand over a lot of a bunch of uh, apple to me. So I have to carefully pick out which one is routing or which one is false positive. So by doing so, I apply a, mat a method, simply go straight forward from relocation. But in that relocation process, I have to limit to, to the face picking for each event by having a minimum of a four P arrival and three S arrival as a minimum. So I that's a kind of trial error process. I start from two, two combination, and then leave out to four, three, which give me a much confident results. So as you can see from the left panel on your screen. So the up one is the candidate events from template matching over 1000 events. And the lower one is the candidate events from New Mexico Tech catalog. So I went through the catalog from 2017 all the way down to 2021. I go the events that have a magnitude larger than 1.5 to get rid of those false positive or not enough to do a relocation. You need to have less reliable face picking. So after I build out a database, I go. I use a 3D model, which you mentioned by Mary already. So it's a it is a tomographic model I developed in 2019. I using the local earthquake data and the Taylor seismic data to perform a joint inversion. If you are interested, I can send you a link to that paper. If you are interested, so the area for this model cover is bounded by the yellow line. So it covers almost for the whole Permian Basin. The benefit and the advantage of this model is that once any cluster pop up in any, anywhere in the Permian Basin, I can quickly pull over any public station to do a real relocation without going bother to find any regional grounding model. So another benefit is I can ease myself once I got, if I use a 1D model, if I got a suspicious depth, I probably scratch my head, think of, okay, can this model be wrong or can this pick be wrong? So with this 3D model, I can easily rule out the possibility that the model is not good. Although the, the improvement on this, for this model is continuous, but at this moment, this 3D model is good enough to relocate all the events. So as a result, after all the QC process, they end up with uh, 774 events. It's eligible or qualified to do the, for, for the further interpretation. So here I give you a overview and the statistics. So first, what exactly the list seismicity represent? So after all the QC process, it turns out we can identify several cluster. For example, you can see prominent cluster is a crossing the Texas and the New Mexico border. And this clusters pop up in some way in 2018. And then of course, this one is Decker draw, which has long history of the indo in this area. But also from the catalog, you can also see a, a kind of cluster popping up in this area. And most importantly, I do see several clusters that correlate with the previous mapped fault. For example, in the 
Central Basin Platform Area. We have this cost pop up in 2021. So they almost correlate, well correlate with the, the foam trace here. And in the Delaware Basin, I can see a cluster will correlate with this full trace as well. And also in between the border and the whip facility, I see a several isolated cluster, which there's no certain linear geometry present here. And in terms of the depth content, they mostly concentrate in the depths of uh, six kilometers to 12 kilometers. And for the area between two and four counter is mostly attributed to the cluster in the, Delaware, in the central basin platform. And in terms of the time span, you can see the seismicity uh, significantly popping up in late 2019, mostly from this cluster and this cluster, as well as for this cluster. So let's first go to the deep detail about where they are and how they distribute in terms of space. So here I go to each uh, depth layer like you peel off the lasagna. So first, from the statistic of the focal depth, there's not much earthquake above one kilometer. So I start from the two to three kilometer depth. So you can see it's quite concentrated in this central basin platform full trace, all the way down to six to seven kilometers, you can still see it's quite widely distributed from subsurface down to seven kilometer for this cluster. And you can see majority of the events they distributed in the area across the New Mexico and Texas border. And most concentrate at the six to seven in this plot. And further deeper. And you don't see quite many for this cluster down to eight to nine kilometer depth range, but you can still see the cluster across the border still present. So that means it's quite active than any other subcluster in this region. Also, let's go to see how they across the time span. So for 2017, there's not much activity in this area, mostly concentrated in the dagger draw. And 18, we start to see some minor or lone wolf pop up around whip. And then in 19, 2019, you start to see some cluster pop up across the border. And then the height of the activity across the border in 2020, continuous on 2021. Notably, this cluster quite concentrates in 2021. So you can see there, they can dramatically pop up in the last two years, which may be attributed to the increase of the full injection, which I have no detailed data to support my argument, but it's a worse direct, worse noting direction to go on in the future. So once we have the seismicity geometry, let's go to see the rupture pattern. So in order to further realize what's the rupture pattern and the dynamics for this earthquake, I have to go through the moment tensor inversion to study the uh, focal mechanism so I can see the stress field and what's the uh, strain pattern is. So here I use the waveform moment tensor inversion. This technique was based on Cal and uh, the Drew, Drew and Rivera to build up this whole pack, package. So once I got the moment tensor inversion results, I start from there to convert the whole beach boat into a stress field by doing stress inversion. And then from stress inversion results, I start to convert the 3D stress field into a horizontal and vertical stress field. Notably, people are more interested in the SH max. So here's the results I can, I'm going to present for this area. Here I show you an example of the waveform fitting fit. This one is quite well fit. And in particular, this one is the mechanism just referred by Mary in the beginning. It's a 
it's for a mangrove four in local uh, local local scale in on July 19, 2021. You can see uh, no more faulting in this area. The number on the beach ball protection represent the station number of each event of, of, of each station. And as a result, I got five focal mechanism for the cluster across the border. And they all present consistently in normal faulting. You can see they extend in the northwest, the southeast direction. It's similar to the one, the biggest one in Diver Basin in recent years, which is the Manton earthquake sequence. But in Manton area, the, the, fault, the, strike, the strike is quite due east west. And in the across the across the border, it tilt a little bit counterclockwise. It's quite similar to the one we got for, from the Dagger Drop field oil field. So that suggests the whole Delaware Basin, along with the one we got from Central Bas Central Delaware Basin, that suggests the whole Delaware Basin extending but the extending direction rotate across the basin. And here is the, the SH max direction from the borehole measurement compiled by Blonsny and Zubak in 2018. So you can see the stress, the SH max is a little bit tilt from this direct measurement. But overall, they show some consistency, not perfect consistency, but somewhat degree of consistency. Notably, for the area nearby the WIPS facility, in November 13, there's a one magnitude 3.2 occur at eight kilometer depth, which is only 20 kilometers away from the WIPS. So the significance of this, mag this magnitude of earthquake is in the future, you might, can, you might see or we, there's a possibility in the future we will have the similar size earthquake occur again. Because once that means this, the reality for the basement top is sustainable to host such size earthquake again. So that, but when will it happen? I don't know. It may probably depends on how the flow injection, how they conduct the flow injection, how, what's the rate they inject. So that's, Again, that's worth noting for the further study. And overall, we do see similarity in across the Delta Basin is extending, but the extending direction and stress field rotating. So that's basically for my part, and then head back to Mary. Uh, Mary sorry about that. Uh, Mary? Yeah, no, sorry, I'm just sharing my screen now. Okay, so uh, thanks, Dino, for um, showing those results. Um, just to sort of summarize, um, after doing the template matching, we uh, and uh, you know, pruning out ones that we weren't able to um, get good locations for. We uh, built a final catalog uh, consisting of 774 events uh, detected and relocated using Dino's updated velocity model um, between our, st the, our study years of 2018 and the first uh, nine months of uh, 2021 uh, in this area that we we're looking at. Uh, we were able to uh, basically, for most of the earthquakes, uh, see that they happened uh, in one or several clusters, although you know, we still did see some that were sort of um, spread throughout the region. Uh, in general, we saw that most of the events were located between six and kilometers depth in this region with uh, the depth changing a little bit, the average depth changing a bit depending on um, which cluster the earthquakes were located in. And you know, we also confirmed uh, as we had been seeing previously that the uh, total amount of events um, increased significantly 
over this time period. Uh, so overall, you know, as a result of this project, we were able to expand our catalog and more importantly, um, get much better locations and depths for these events. And uh, I, this is gonna be um, extremely useful because uh, there are several other projects that are either planned for the near future or currently underway in uh, the Northern Delaware Basin. Um, at, in Texas, uh, Dino tells me that you guys are working on uh, characterization of the basement rooted faults. And by having the focal mechanisms that Dino calculated along with the more accurate locations for the earthquakes, um, you'll, you'll be much, it will be much easier to uh, try and you know, constrain uh, where these faults might be located. Um, here at New Mexico Tech, we've been working on using machine learning for event detection um, and uh, having a better catalog for training data uh, is going to help us uh, as we try to bring that online for our um, improving our monitoring capabilities going forward. Um, and then at New Mexico Tech, we're also uh, hoping to begin a project um, to use poor elastic modeling uh, with uh, the uh, program Pyleth to better, uh, you know, basically to, to model how, how is the um, fluid flow uh, in this region actually interacting with the geology and potentially causing this slip. Um, and again, uh, having a more accurate catalog of earthquakes uh, will make all of these projects, uh, you know, much more effective uh, as we move forward towards uh, you know, getting a better understanding of the seismicity that's happening in this region and the potential uh, causes for it. Um, so uh, we're also still working on this project. You know, we, we have uh, several more tasks that we'd like to do. The catalog is you know, in a much better state than it was before the project, but there's, there's always room to improve. Um, we want to eventually uh, run the template matching uh, on our uh, entire set of continuous data stretching back uh, to 2013 and potentially even earlier. Uh, we didn't do it for this project because it takes a pretty long time to run the template matching. And we know that there weren't that many earthquakes in this period. So um, the, you know, well, we would still like to detect additional ones using the template matching and uh, ensure a more complete catalog. Um, you know, we wanted to focus for now on the time period when most of the seismicity has been occurring, which is um, the past few years. Um, we're also uh, working to improve the PICs uh, that the uh, um, templates are based on. Uh, we included PICs, as I, sh I showed you those USGS stations ha that had been added uh, recently, we included some PICs from those stations, but not from all of them. So we're working to incorporate picks from all of those stations, which will also improve our accuracy for these locations. Um, we you know, potentially want to use EQ core scan for subspace detection, as I mentioned, which um, can allow us to find uh, more events that we weren't able to find using just the basic uh, cross correlation. Um, in addition, uh, well, Dino, um, relocated the events using this his improved velocity model. Um, we still need to uh, do a double difference relocation of the events where instead of um, finding the absolute location for events, we uh, use a, uh, we find the relative location which will further uh, increase the accuracy of the events and hopefully help us um, better be able to see this sort of specific faulting locations uh, in this area. Um, and then finally, uh, I'd like to recalculate um, some of the magnitudes for the events, trying to uh, use the same methodology um, that TextNet uses for their magnitude calculations, so that uh, in the future, we'll be able to have a um, more comparable uh, uh, comparison um, and measurement uh, between uh, earthquakes you know, detected in New Mexico and Texas, but both in this uh, in this area, um, you know, in the same basin, the Delaware Basin. Um, and finally, I just wanted to get ba get back a little bit to uh, Dino's slide where he uh, was 
talking about you know some of the you know events that we've been seeing recently, uh, particularly uh, in proximity to the the WIP nuclear waste disposal facility. Um, you know this is an area that uh, you know definitely has a, a significant hazard of um, potential. Uh, seismic activity and the consequences of that activity could be particularly uh, dangerous uh, given the location of that facility. And we have in recent years been seeing some clusters of events popping up uh, in closer proximity to that area. So, you know, as always, uh, more work is needed to, to characterize this hazard. And, you know, we're hopeful that this new catalog that we've produced can be a basis for a lot of that work. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming, and uh, Dino and I will take any questions now. Great. Thank you, uh, Dino and Mary. Excellent. Um, and uh, we had uh, we have a number of, of questions that are um, that were typed into the chat box. And so um, I, I will go ahead and, and ask the first one since um, since I'm already on mic. Um, and so just I just want to try to get us a, a sense of when you're doing template matching. Um, you know, for, for the people who are not hardcore seismologists, what is the computational load when you're trying to basically match um, components with a larger network? Can you kind of give a little bit of a sense of, of the difficulty computationally and being able to do that and, and, how, um, and how that might be um, maybe reduced or made more efficient? And that would be for yeah. either Dino or Mary. Yeah. So for this project, we didn't um, have access to any sort of uh, supercomputing facility. Um, and so uh, computational constraints were an issue. It generally took, um, you know, with the number of, you know, the, the computational cost scales with, you know, the number of templates you use um, and, you know, the amount of data that you're trying to get through. Um, and we typically um, were set up to run through about a year of data at a time with our, um, with our um, 350 ish events that we selected. And each run would take two to three days to, to complete for a year's worth of data. Um, and, you know, we, I mean, obviously, so when we were testing out the parameters, obviously we didn't run it on a full year, um, but we did, you know, sort of have to go through a fair bit of work to try and, uh, s you know, select parameters that, that gave us. Um, you know, good results, but not too many false positives, and then to run it um, through all the data that we did. So it, it, you know, it's not not like super crazy, but it definitely was a, a fair computational burden. Right, and of course, if you were doing optimization on those parameters, it would become crazy complicated. Yeah, uh, so we didn't we didn't optimize the parameters on the full data set. We we tested them on a smaller data set, and then once we selected the parameters we were going to use, then we just ran it on the full data set. Great, thanks. Um, uh, Jerry Boak asks, so what is the relationship of depth of earthquakes to depth of basement and depth of injection in New Mexico? Okay, maybe I can answer the question about the depth of earthquake to the basin basement interface. Based on our data, the basin basement interface is located around two to, sorry, three to 3.5 kilometers in our study area. So as you can see from the, the statistic of the focal depth, most of the earthquake was located beneath the basement basement interface. That's why I, that's why I interpret it as a basement rooted faults. But as to what's the injection depth, currently I have no data handy, so I cannot answer that question. Maybe someone from either BG or from Mary, you can answer this question. Yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily have it off the top of my head. I know that, um, let me see if I can pull something up real fast. Like there is some deeper injection occurring in this area. Um, and certainly the total amount of injection has been uh, increasing significantly, but I'm not sure what exactly the, um, the depths that are being happened. Like I know that in this area, uh, there is both shallow and deep injection. There's there's many different um, saltwater disposal areas in this area. And um, as to what the those exact depths are though, I'm not really sure. 
So uh, Peter Hennings here at UT mentioned that uh, Scissor has uh, the injection data tabulated. Um, so that could that could answer some of the questions that uh, that uh, Jeremy had. Yeah, is that is that somewhere that's uh, publicly available? I'm not sure. So Peter, are you can you can you mic up? Yeah, he says just ask. So maybe he's not on yeah. mic, but you know, I know I'm, can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Well, hi there. Thank you, uh, Mary and Dino. Yeah, we've just um, we can certainly help with that uh, information. We've just um, done a as my well, I don't want to jump in here in front of other people, but maybe I was nearly next. We've just got finished tabulating all of that deep injection uh, information. We've figured out like what formations they're in, what the injection height intervals are and all the rest of that. So it, it's, it's available. And if you'd like uh, um, access to pieces of it, we'd be, uh, we'd be happy, to, happy to help with that. Yeah, no, I'm definitely interested in it. I'll, I'll send you an email. And if, if that's something that I can you know, easily go through and like get sort of some summary data from it, um, that would be really helpful. Cause yeah, I mean, for this project, we it was sort of this project, we were sort of going for the first step of getting accurate earthquake locations, but um, getting a better sense of how that relates to the injection is definitely a really important next step. So yeah, the earthquake data is just yeah. critical. And so glad that you've done that. You'll, are you coming to our meeting starting tomorrow? Uh, I'll be there virtually. <laughs> You'll see, we've done a, we built a, a new geological model. There's a couple of thousand wells in it. Uh, and we've done a new pore pressure model. JP Nico and June Gu have done that. And it's a pore pressure model. It looks at the injection from 1983 up until 2020. And it shows our first pass of predicted pore pressure change uh, in all that strata underneath the Wolf Camp shales on top of the basement, which is the majority of the injection in that earthquake area that you've, um, you've highlighted today. So there's a lot of pieces coming together in this collaboration, uh, I would say, which is pretty exciting. It is exciting. Thanks, Peter. Um, so let me have, have, have a question here that's kind of related that, that, that Stefan, I'm hallucinator. I don't know if I got that right. Hopefully I did. He, his question is, uh, how do we get access to these vents? And um, are they, are they going to be added, uh, Mary, to your catalog, your state catalog? Uh, so the the long-term plan is to... Um, uh, what, once we uh, get get this more finalized um, and uh, you know potentially publish about the the long term plan is to add it to our catalog. However, I will say I uh, do respond to emails, and if you want me to send you the the data that we have, um, I'm I'm always happy to to share the data. But in terms of posting on the website, we're going to wait until um, it's a little bit more finalized. Great. Okay, Stefan. So take note. And he also asks, um, will the hypo DD events also be available as a companion catalog? And I assume that after things are published um, and, and analyzed, and yeah, that would be some of those. Yeah, I mean, we, right? cer we certainly would be looking to make that available publicly in some way. I'm not sure um, whether that would be posting it directly to our website or posting it in like a data repository or something. Um, but absolutely, the plan would be to make it publicly available. Great. Great. Um, Margaret Glasgow, who is, uh, by the way, a RISC webinar alumni, uh, alumnus, uh, asks, how did you decide which earthquakes to use as a template? Yeah, so we um, basically took all the earthquakes that were um, larger than, I think we used magnitude 1.9, and that was just sort of a trade-off between getting a um, large number of events and um, having it be too computationally intensive. My understanding is that you know, having more templates is always a good thing, assuming that, you know, your templates are good. Um, but we couldn't really do too, too many because uh, it would have become computationally prohibitive. Yep, exactly. Um, um, so let's see. So uh, Julie Shimada um, has, says, a nice talk. What is the correlation of seismicity with energy operations in the area? And I, I know that that is an overall goal of what you all are trying to do. Yeah. Um, I mean you know, this is that's sort of a, the moding fading factor behind all this. We, you know, do see correlations um, between the seismicity and general areas where some of this, um, you know, production, the, the disposal is occurring. Um, but until we have better data, we can't 
really say with certainty, you know, how strong, are, I mean, like, what are those correlations or like, you know, which wells are potentially um, causing the seismicity. So the, the goal of this research is to go from a vague, yes, there's a correlation to understanding that correlation and sort of specifying, you know, what are the specific causes of the seismicity that we're seeing. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, excellent. So um, Scott um, Boats, I think, hopefully I'm getting the names right today. Uh, since you think that the majority of these earthquakes are at eight to 10 kilometer depth, have you been able to correlate these to location of the deep saltwater disposal wells? And I think that that kind of tees off, it kind of stems off a little bit from the discussion earlier in terms of the injection depths. Right. So again, you know, not yet, um, but that's something that we're looking to do. Excellent. Um, so let me ask you a question, you know, for, for the people who are not hardcore seismologists, I put myself in that category. So when you're doing these relocations um, and you had your original earthquakes uh, that were located in terms of uh, the hypocenters, how, what was the, what did it, what were the differences? Uh, did you have a, did you make a histogram or a scatter plot or anything in terms of the amount of distances either laterally or at depth that the earthquakes changed because of this work? No, we didn't. I mean, you can you saw on Dino's slide where he showed the the pre catalog before and after the relocation that in general the events became much more clustered, um, but uh, we didn't specifically track how much they changed by. So, what what would your intuition tell you? Well, in from observation, they probably uh, if with more more comprehensive coverage, the, hypo, the epicenter would shift us by maybe one or two kilometers. One significant or most extreme case is they look along, probably, they probably shift by five kilometers. After five I, kilometers I, laterally. Yes, five kilometers laterally after I add the most, more picks. So it's, it's kind of, it's a trade-off. It's the location may shift depend, depending on how many events the picks you put into the location process and what's the weight for each picks you assign to. It's kind of trade off. I think if you are hardcore side, hardcore seismologist, you know that so many tricks can be played in this location process. Although I don't play too much trick in this relocation process. I just put genuine weight and then see how they affect each other. So, but, Mostly they shift by one or two kilometers. For some extreme case, they should shift by five kilometers. Uh -huh. In terms of depth, I, I don't have original to compare. Well, for original depth, it's about five kilometers everywhere. If you look at the uh, New Mexico Tech catalog, everything is five kilometer depth. So it's, it's not meaningful to compare mine with their results because we use different approach. Right, so the so so if everything's at five kilometer depth, is that a default depth that yeah. is basically set by the by the USGS or by New Mexico? By by us. Um, so basically, uh, you know, our our previous methods for calculating uh, earthquake locations, um, due to the sparsity of stations in the area and um, the fact that we were using a pretty simple velocity model, um, the uncertainty in our depth locations was sufficiently high that we just don't um, report depths. Um, but one of the things that we're trying to transition to is reporting depths. And that's why, you know, going back and reanalyzing our old data um, using this new velocity model uh, is really important. And, um, you know, starting in, in, in 2022, we are um, hoping to start reporting depths as well using, um, you know, I mean, using uh, this, the same velocity model that, that Dino has generated um, as well. Awesome. And, and, and Dino, can you, can you sort of um, uh, speak a little bit about what you, you sense as the error in your relocated depths? And I thought it was great to actually bin the events by depth in kilometers. What, what's your sense of the plus or minus on some of those? Well, for horizontal error, I, my best bet probably around one or two kilometer in average. But for the depths, it's kind of tricky. Depends on the distribution of the picks. Because at earlier stage, I only have uh, picks from the single channel station and quite sparse. So it's probably, will be, you can expect larger uh, vertical error, error range. But 
move on to 2021. Once I add more earthquake data, more picks from USGS station, that can be reduced the same level as the horizontal uncertainty. So it's not quite one single standard to describe the, the, the uncertainty for all years. So it, it varies across years. Yeah, that, that's, that's terrific. And, and I, I'm sure that uh, that is really the goal is to reduce that. And if you're using HypoDD, I imagine that you're gonna be able to further constrain some of those errors. Um, yeah. So it's a lot of very su super useful given that uh, the only transuranic waste disposal site in the country is just to the Northwest of that basin. Um, let me, here's a question from, uh, from Margaret again. For Dino, are the locations of the faults in your figures for mapping, that, are you mapping these as, are these surface expressions? I believe that's probably that's right. And it's from the US technology map of Texas. So I believe it's a service expression. So you can see around the whip facility, there's a blank. But based on the seismicity distribution, you can tell there's a active force, at least for now it's seismogenic. So you can use the seismicity as a proxy to estimate the full trace. That's what has been done by Lily already. So in for the Delaware Basin. So I'm sure that's this result can be beneficial to her as well. Right. Excellent. Thank you. And if, uh, finally, we're, we're down to a couple minutes here. So uh, Peter asks, um, from the Mexico perspective or from WIP, uh, if, is there a sense um, of a probabilistic hazard and or risk assessment for induced seismicity at that facility? Do you know, uh, Mary, you're, you're, in, you're in country, so to speak, uh, whether there are discussions at WIP regarding this or is that uh, not being, that hasn't really been raised up to that level yet? So, I, I mean, certainly it has been brought to their attention and people are sort of thinking about it a little bit. Um, I'm not sure that there's enough urgency in the concern about it. Like, like it's certainly something that everyone agrees would be a good thing to have. Um, but uh, in terms of the urgency towards, you know, funding it and, and um, things like that, it, 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 we're, we're still getting there, I would say. Yep, yep, um, great. Um, I don't know if there's other questions. Um, I see Robert from Nanometrics is, uh, is on camera. I don't know, Robert, if you have a question. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you. Um, so uh, with that, it's, it, 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 unless there's any other questions, I just want to, uh, I'm gonna to toss this over to Lily. Um, and she can have the sort of final goodbyes, but I, I really appreciate uh, uh, Mary and Dino for your time and, and your discussions and for everybody being here. So Lily, take it away. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. And yeah, thank you, Mary and Dino, for this very informative joint presentation. Um, before we take off, I want to gratefully acknowledge the U.S. Department of Energy, the National Energy Technology Laboratory, and the Groundwater Protection Council for funding this webinar series, as well as conducting the and the research conducted within our collaborative. Um, our next webinar will take place after the new year and thanks everyone and take care. I hope everybody has a great holiday. Thank you. Thanks everyone.